Production funding for Arts Upload has been provided in part by Muriel McBrien Kaufman Foundation, Hall Family Foundation, Francis Family Foundation, The Hartwig Family, Richard J. Stern Foundation for the Arts, Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, and viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Randy Mason. And I'm Mara Sailor. The Arvest Bank Theater at the Midland is our backdrop for another edition of Arts Upload. This week, we've got stories about something big, murals. And something really small, beads. Plus a poet and a theater company with a storied past. It's all ahead on the Upload. Jessica Kincaid does beadwork, but that doesn't really do justice to what you're about to see. The stunning tapestries she creates are drawn from dreams and the world around her, and they've brought her accolades like a Charlotte Street Award. Producer and videographer Julie Denishe spent time at Jessica's studio at the Interurban Art House to show you how she works. Bead by bead. I think that my work comes from all the different things in my environment. When I work in the beads, it means that I'm trying to memorialize something. That's what painters do. I'm a painter with my beads. I want to make something tangible from the things that I'm seeing or things I experience. The natural images that I use tend to be things that I'm emotionally drawn to that really pull me in. It could be a moment in time when I'm really just captured by the play of light on a branch with icicles or the way that the sunlight hits leaves on a branch looking translucent and glowing depending on the time of day. Jessica Kincaid is one of the more underappreciated artists working in Kansas City right now. You know, and she works quietly under the radar. It's, it's not really the use of material, I think, that is interesting about the work, but it's a kind of a painting with the bead. And the bead is, is less of a pixel, you know, than you can think of them as little kind of a jewel-like pixels comprising the image. And I, the bead is less that than a kind of a lens for light. So each, each bead begins to kind of play off of another one, creating a sense of light and color. I've always enjoyed the, the way that the beads capture the light and I've always enjoyed the tactile nature of them because I started learning to work with textiles when I was about 15. I learned how to knit, crochet, tap, weave, spin, dye fabric, all these different methods of interlacement and working with cloth. I just loved it. When you step back far enough from the work of art, your eye completes the the shapes and the and it blends the colors. Jessica's work begins to kind of emanate light, reflect light create all these weird uh, color interactions. And so they begin to vibrate and 
um, shimmer. The process of making my work, this laborious kind of um, one bead at a time and one concentrated effort at a time and this intense focus is part of how I process. I don't force myself to hurry and I just understand that's part of the struggle that I have um, in committing things to memory. I know once I've figured out what the picture is, then I can kind of relax. Then it becomes sort of a paint by number for me. I've already got it planned out and there's also kind of a liberating thing about not being able to take the work out after I get past a certain point and it is meditative. If somebody's a painter and they've got something to say, then they go and use paint. And my craft or my medium was beads, and so that was what I went to. You've just seen some great art on a very small scale. Now let's turn to something considerably larger. Murals painted by an artist who studied with Thomas Hart Benton at the Kansas City Art Institute many years ago. In fact, Eric Bransby just turned 100 and is about to be featured in a new documentary by Jay Chris called A Last Mural, soon to air on KCPT. One of Bransby's many murals around the area is at Rockhurst University. We watched this summer as it got some tender loving care, and we got to learn more about an often overlooked artist with great local connection. Eric certainly comes out of Benton, out of Boardman Robinson, out of the mural movement of the 1930s. The figure is absolutely dominant. But I wanted figures that uh, would actually feel like they're in motion. And I'll get that composition working like uh, dancers on a stage. If the name Eric Bransby doesn't ring a bell, don't feel bad. Last fall, when the 98-year-old returned to town for the Big Benton Show at the Nelson Atkins Museum, even Curator of American Art Stephanie Knapp realized she should learn more about this Kansas City Art Institute graduate with the illustrious body of work. Eric said when he came to Kansas City in 1938, he did not know who was going to be you know, waiting for him in the classroom. So Benton, uh, in 1934, made the cover of Time magazine. He was one of the most renowned American artists. His murals were across the country. His prints were being disseminated widely. And here you have a young artist, a budding artist, who is hitching a ride from Iowa. And then boom, there's Thomas Hart Benton in his classroom. Eric was talking about how Benton did not tolerate abstraction in the classroom, yet at the same time, Eric was pointing out some of the more abstract elements in his American Historical Epic series. While the art world was briskly moving away from it, both Benton and Bransby kept faith in the figurative and loved teaching it to others. Donna Bachman and Andrea Wrinkle both studied under Bransby at UMKC. You don't often have the kind of mentoring and kindness that I encountered with Eric and Marianne Bransby. I named my son after him. <laughs> she also helped him get a gig. In 1991, Bransby created this brightly colored fresco for the new McAfee Memorial Library underground at Park University. As always, Bachman says he immersed himself in the story the mural would eventually tell. He learned about Park University, or then Park College, and one of the missions of Park College was to educate missionaries. And you see that reference there in the middle section. A few years. A painting like this is a performance. You can't just get up there on the scaffolding and think, hmm, what mood am I in? It's all been uh, pre-designed and pre-planned. Again, on the bottom, it's mostly on the Despite 25 years of subterranean conditions and pedestrian traffic, the fresco shows surprisingly small amounts of wear and tear.
This summer, another of the area's numerous Bransby murals, the one he did at Rockhurst in 1969, was taken down panel by panel from its home in Greenlease Library and taken across campus for some TLC by a triage team of Donna, Andrea, and metal man Webb Thomas. There was a slight warpage and then that good scrape along the bottom and a few little dings. So I'm so pleased that Rockhurst University found the resources and the will to uh, do right by this treasure. We might do a little more filling in that. There's a little teensy crevasse there. Well, I learned a lot from him because I worked on some murals with him, like the one in Liberty. Also, there's one up near Chicago in Skokie. And then I did a little work on the K-State one, too. Though neither had a hand in the making of this particular piece, their familiarity with Bransby's style of layering and sense of color hastened the process along. A student years ago, I was helping him on a project. He said, you know, Donna, you're not painting a kitchen cabinet <laughs> because of the, the subtle use of layers. I had to say, OK, there's a yellow green here, but I need to gray it up. So I just kept playing with those. Now I'm going to do a batch to, to match that dark one. The infill, touch-ups, and even a new coat of varnish were all accomplished in a matter of weeks leaving only the aluminum frames that Coming Thomas's team was building to help stop the warpage and make it easier to reposition 18 feet of panels on the library wall. But plans and reality don't always sync up, meaning a morning filled with this and this, Seems like it's about plus a trip for more supplies to ensure that Bransby's work would live comfortably here for years to come. It was a day-long task, so it was a beautiful thing. When they finally reinstalled all the little attachments to do this amazing balancing act. So that's a wonderful feeling to prepare it for another generation, to enjoy 50 years from now be somebody else's job to revisit. And what's for me fascinating is that although the name might not be well known, because he has murals in places like high schools, in municipal buildings, in colleges, his art is known. So people are living with his art. You know, students at University of Missouri, Kansas City, when they go to the Nichols Library, they're walking up and down the staircase. They're seeing Eric Bransby's Primavera, and it's something that is part of their part of their lives. So the art is part of their lives, and hopefully, with the celebration of Eric Bransby, uh, his name will be part of their lives as well. A Last Mural will be part of American Masters on PBS next spring, but we've got a preview for KCPT viewers on Thursday, October 27th at 8 p.m. Here on Arts Upload, we've tried to make sure the literary arts don't get left out, poetry in particular. Producer Justin Bond has captured a number of talented local folk performing their own original works, and this week, he's got a new one. The poet's name is Jason Prue. His poem is called Objective Observations. Objective observations, objectively observed, while circumambulating my office building in a most objective manner. Number one, there is a bird foot on the sidewalk, squashed, perhaps gooey. The rest of the bird is not my objective. Number two, flowers bloom Sick red, sweet yellows. I do not know their genus or species. They object to my name for them anyway. Number three, a thin, balding man runs past me with white buds in his ears. He looks a little like me, for I too am thin and balding by any objective standards. I hear music leaking from the man's ear holes. I cannot say whether it is Stone Temple Pilots or Bush, but I know it to be one of those bands. OK, OK, you got me. It might be Soundgarden or Pearl Jam. Number four. Underneath the building lies a parking garage. Though I cannot see it, I objectively know it is there. Though I cannot hear it, 
I know objectively it is there, though I cannot taste it. I know it is objectively there, though I cannot touch it. I know it objectively is there. I can smell it. It is there objectively. Number five. Across the street, a young woman disembarks the bus. She has plum colored stockings. The bus doors close. She cries out. Her lips, her. Number six. The sky, the sidewalk. The trees, the taxis, the window clouds, the street grass, the bird horns, the wind signs, everything. It's the Arvest Bank Theater at the Midland now. But when the Lowe's Midland Theater was built back in 1927, just before the stock market mm -hmm. crash, they spared no expense. Lots of gold leaf, crystal chandeliers, and thanks to renovations in 2007, it still looks great today, hosting roughly 150 events and concerts each year. Here's my favorite bit of Midland trivia. In 1961, it was home to the professional bowling team, the Kansas City <laughs> Stars. They didn't last. Well, our last story this week is about something that did. Sacramento's music circus. It's the first time I heard the term tune tents. <laughs> and as you're about to see, it's still going strong 65 years later. And now I invite you to enjoy our music circus production of West Side Story. Maria, I just met a girl named Maria. And suddenly that name will never be the same to me. I could have danced all night. I could have danced all night. And still have begged for more. This is the dawn. Yeah. It, it starts with the, our audience, you know. We, we try to take our audience on a journey, a, a balanced meal of American musical theater through the course of the summer. I think Music Circus is a, a well-known entity throughout the theater world, and, um, and we definitely have great community support here. Sacramento has a thriving arts community, the performing arts, the visual arts, great painters, great musicians, great dance. I mean, I think it's, it's all happening here. And what I hope we're also doing is creating the next generation of artists that go beyond Sacramento and bring a little bit of Sacramento to the likes of New York and Los Angeles and maybe beyond. The Music Circus was established in 1951. In the uh, late 40s, uh, my father, Russell Lewis, and his partner, Howard Young, were Broadway producers. As will happen to any Broadway producer, their last play on Broadway did not perform well financially. And so they returned to the West Coast and looking around for what is the next big thing for them to take on. At that time, there was a phenomenon in the United States called tune tents. And what it provided was an opportunity for an audience to experience not just musical theater, but musical theater in a very special format, which is in the round. The uh, first tent was actually right there on the corner of 15th and H. In 1969, Russell and Howard determined that in order to attract uh, acts like Liberace or uh, Marlena Dietrich or Bob Hope, etc., that they needed a, a larger seating capacity and therefore higher potential growth. So they bought the corner that we're sitting in right now, and uh, the tent in 1969 then opened with a capacity, a little in excess of 2,500 seats. <laughs> There are very few theater companies in the country that are able to bring together the level of talent on stage and off stage to create the works that we do. 
because they literally are the best of Broadway. When you're on the stage, you do feel that it's an intimate setting, even though you're in the middle of 2,200 people. The music circus, circus in the round, it's a unique experience that you don't get in other theaters. We're all used to proscenium, but now you've got to be, I mean, every inch of you has to be acting and has, because people are all around you. I think that um, great vocalists know how to interpret the, the songs in, in each of these musicals in a way that is indescribable and then takes them someplace completely different with each and every, every song. My first and foremost is safety. Depending on the show, it's like Peter Pan. Peter Pan was probably the hardest show we've done technically uh, in the 20 years that I've been here. We had four people flying at the same time. Scenic pieces going up and down in the dark. It was an adrenaline rush to get through the show. When you, when you see all of that come together and gel is, is one of the most satisfying things I can imagine happening. Great art um, really kind of gets to the core of the human experience. And those could be new works, and they could be works that have existed for many decades and have been produced here over and over and over. Responsible directors and producers are, are true to the texts. There are shows like Big River, like West Side Story, um, and even in Hair that have elements that are unflattering moments in history that are disturbing. Themes of, of racism and sexism and violence. But I think that it's important to understand our past so that we don't repeat it, so that we are reminded of how far we've come and in, and in some cases reminded of where we need to go. This community theater dealing with issues that were relevant to me really opened my mind and broadened my horizons to uh, dream of bigger and better things and that's why I think these type of theaters are so important and I may not get to express how I feel publicly on certain issues I will be able to express myself in, as the character. As summer theaters go, particularly summer theaters that are put together in a relatively short amount of time, there's nothing better in the country that I have ever seen than this. Thousands of people are coming to the music circus every performance. They're packing the house. There's a thirst to see theater. The nice thing about the Music Circus in particular is that it really is a family. There's actors who I've worked with that have, that have been coming back, and it's, it really is a family feel here. We have an incredible network of support here in Sacramento, a long tradition, and I hope that this company is able to sustain another 65 years of, of providing the best of musical theater to Sacramento and in Northern California. Back here in Kansas City, the beauty of the Midland never fails to impress. It's the largest historical theater within 250 miles. It's also where we'll bid you adieu from as another episode of Arts Upload rolls into the history books. We'll take a short break and come back with more music and theater, dance, and the visual arts in 2017. Whoa. <laughs> Till then, I'm Randy Mason. And I'm Maris Aylward. Thanks for watching. Here in Kansas City, it's all about the sauce. It's not all about the sauce. It's all about the meat, and it always has been, and it always will be. Hey, baby. Kansas City is a barbecue mecca for all types of meat. I really want to shake.
So that's the beautiful thing about Kansas City. It's the melting pot of everywhere. That's why we do everything well. And burn ends perfectly. <laughs> now I'm gonna stop. Feel it when it's you know, I can enjoy an awesome ribeye or a filet mignon, but a properly cooked burn in might be the most flavor you're ever going to get out of a cow. And I think burn ends is our sort of our umami, I guess. You know, it's that flavor you can't really describe. For whatever reason, Kansas City learned how to do that, and that's why people come here to eat it. You can't get that anywhere else. Girl, your lips is gonna be wild. Production funding for Arts Upload has been provided in part by Muriel McBrien Kaufman Foundation, Hall Family Foundation, Francis Family Foundation, The Hartwig Family, Richard J. Stern Foundation for the Arts, Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, and viewers like you. Thank you.